Hello and welcome to episode 15 of season 2 of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. In this episode, I spoke with Jonathan Hale, Professor of Architectural Theory at the University of Nottingham, about his book Merleau-Ponty for Architects, published by Routledge in 2017 as part of their Thinkers for Architects series. So I think one of Merleau-Ponty's key statements, I suppose, is to say that, yeah, the, the body is not uh, an object in the world, the body is some kind of orientation towards the world. So the body is actually yeah, not an object, but it's a set of capacities or a set of abilities to do things in the world that often involve picking up bits of the world and momentarily making them part of our bodies. Literally tools, hand tools, pens, hammers, motor cars, all, all those kind of technical extensions. And I would say as an architect, including the architectural setting in which particular actions take place and maybe of course even the city in which the space is located you know all of those are kind of organizations of space that enable things to happen that, that couldn't really happen without them and to, to draw a kind of distinction to say no no the body ends at the skin and then the world begins end of story that's problematic so that's what Meloponti and Heidegger I think they're both equally equally important on on this uh, are really pushing us to, to get away from a is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm here today with Professor Jonathan Hale. Jonathan, would you be a gentleman and introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ambrose. Thank you for the uh, invitation to, uh, to be part of the, uh, the discussion. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Jonathan Hale. I'm Professor of Architectural Theory at uh, the University of Nottingham in the Department of Architecture and, and Built Environment, which is now part of Faculty of Engineering. Um, and my background is as a, as a practicing architect. Uh, that was my, uh, I trained as an architect and practiced for uh, several years in, in London before I started teaching uh, gradually, part-time, and, uh, and then moved into uh, to full-time teaching. Yeah. Where did you study? Well, I did my undergraduate, uh, part one and part two, at the University of Bath. Mm. which was um, at that time uh, very, very, very technical, you might say, very kind of technologically oriented, um, still very much, I guess, steeped in the kind of modernist tradition. Uh, we were taught by a generation of, of people, the senior staff at that time were people like uh, Patrick Hodgkinson, who had uh, very fond of telling the story when, when he met Le Corbusier, when Le Corbusier came to London to receive his RIBA gold medal. Uh, and Patrick and another group, uh, you know, a group of students uh, took took him out. Uh, somebody I think had an old fashioned sports car and uh, took took him out for lunch uh, in this car. So it felt like we were in a way very close to that, literally, you know, two handshakes away from Le Corbusier. Uh, it felt very much like that. And uh, and there wasn't, uh, and it was very technically oriented. The program there wasn't a lot of theory, architectural theory and philosophy uh, was was a kind of marginal discourse, but of course it had a kind of edginess about it, which is one of the things that attracted me. And it's why I've ended up, you know, focusing on that in, in my own uh, teaching. And you worked in practice uh, in London, you said. And, and so, so uh, during that time teaching in London uh, as a tutor, I, I guess, and then, and then finding yourself turned towards. So this is in the 90s, your, your starting that's right. to teach. Yeah, that's right. I graduated in 1989, uh, in the uh, yeah, summer of 89. And I had nearly, really nearly a famous song, but not quite. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I was lucky enough, uh, having said, you know, being taught by really, really good, uh, good people at, at Bath. Um, and I won the silver medal, the RIBA silver medal. So that gave me a head start in a sense yeah. of getting getting a job, which I considered to be my kind of dream, dream job, uh, really. And it, and it certainly turned out that way, which was working for Ted Cullinan. Uh, in in London, so in, in on Regent's Canal. That's right. Yeah, initially we were in Camden Town, so oh, wow. um, not too far from the canal. But <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the first couple of years working in Camden Town, just which was fantastic experience. You know, just mm. thrown straight in. I hadn't lived in London before then. Uh, but my the reason I guess I ended up there. Um, I mean, uh, well, it's fairly obvious if you know, any, of course, anything about Cullinan's uh, approach. Um, a strong focus on uh, on building, if you like, and on on the lessons that can be learned from hands-on experience, mm -hmm. working with materials, and the sort of creativity that can come from literally um, 
just doing you know just sort mm. of working in it almost in a more vernacular kind of kind of way with with mm. found materials and the kind of creativity that that uh, that can emerge from that and um and of course opportunities to teach uh came up very quickly because ted was always being asked to go and give lectures and uh, and he had taught you know o- over the years and had always offered opportunities to colleagues uh, junior colleagues in the office uh, to do that because he couldn't of course phys- literally physically accept all those invitations so that that was fantastic so i got i got to go and lecture about the practices work talking about this sort of back catalog of work work which I hadn't been involved with directly but um, you know I was fascinated to kind of tell stories about if you Mm. like or to to kind of build a kind of narrative Um, and then usually with a sort of case study of the job that I was working on myself at that time in in the office so uh, it's really out of that so I was teaching uh, actually outside of London uh, mainly I did a little spot at the Royal College of Art um, when Theo Crosby was there uh, I was working for, for Ted. I was working on the Fountains Abbey Visitor Centre uh, in Yorkshire, um, which again was, you know, very, a formative experience really, but um, and very focused on uh, relationships with place and the context, mm-hmm. and um, and working with, you know, an interesting, really interesting palette of, of materials, often, you know, and, and, and local materials and so on. So um, that was really interesting experience. But then I yeah started teaching at uh, back at the University of Bath. Uh, one day a week. And this was in the early 90s by then, I guess about 92, and there was a bit of a downturn in the economy. And a lot of architects were were shedding staff. You know, there were a lot of people being made redundant, mm-hmm. and including at, at, uh, at Cullinan's. I managed to survive the, the that kind of uh, that, that moment, if you like, uh, staying on in the office. But we were offered the opportunity to go out and, and teach, um, say, one day or one or two days a week if we wanted to. Um, because, you know, on the, on the basis that there wasn't enough work in the office to employ us all full time, there probably was, but, but it was great to have that opportunity. Mm. And uh, once I'd experienced that, I just realized um, that was probably where I wanted to be in the longer term, you know, yeah. teaching and researching uh, full time. I, I mean, Cullinan's is a wonderful studio. I just want to, because you've, you've mentioned this word materials quite a lot, mm. and we're getting a theme. Um, <clears throat> and this idea of place and context, which brings us to the, to the, the book that you wrote in 20, so published in 2017, isn't it? Um, uh, Merlo Ponty for Architects, which is part of the um, Thinkers for Architects series published by Routledge. Um, and there's a lot in that book. It's a wonderful book and um, beautifully written, as one would expect. But you can see, obviously, your interest or your perhaps your experience, perhaps you got a job in Cullinan's because you're interested in materials and place. Cullinan's emphasizes it, you teach it, and then you, you, you theorize about it. Maybe that's me making assumptions there. Mm-hmm. No, that's, uh, that's, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, how, how that happened. I mean, I started to get interested in phenomenology, I suppose, just more broadly, uh, while I was still a student. Mm-hmm. And that was probably more to do with kind of accidental encounters with ideas coming in from outside of, of the school, if you like. In but that's very distinct from this modernist kind of, this high modernist, what, two handshakes away from the Corbusier kind of thing, is it not? Like, how are you, who was starting to bring phenomenological thinking into the, into your, into your experience? Well, yeah, really good question. I mean, to be honest, it was more other students. Mm -hmm. rather than anything we were taught as part of the kind of, you know, the official curriculum Mm -hmm. at the time, which, as I said, was very, very technically focused, Mm -hmm. not exclusively, but yeah, largely. So no, it was literally other students and specifically, actually, a couple of American exchange students who came from uh, the University of Kentucky. And I think they'd also been taught by somebody who worked with Le Corbusier, uh, strangely enough. But they were reading people like uh, Norberg Schultz, Christian Mm -hmm. Norberg Schultz, and they were, you know, they were talking about it and wondering why we'd never heard of Norbert mm-hmm. Schultz uh, at Bath. And um, so I literally went over to the library and, and dug out um, Norbert Schultz's book, Genius Loci, uh, Phenomenology of Architecture. And I just thought uh, I should have a look at that. You know, this sounds really interesting. Why, why have we not heard of this guy? And uh, there was a little, I think, in the epigraph of the book or, you know, a little footnote at the beginning. He says, the theory of architecture that I apply in this work I, I develop in my first two publications, Intentions in Architecture and Existence, Space and Architecture. 
Now, that combination of words just immediately, I just, I've never heard those words together, you know, in one sentence before. This sounds fascinating. And I'm also somebody very drawn to kind of building from a firm foundation. So rather than dive in and try and read the book Genius Loci, I thought, sure, okay, I need to go back and read Intentions in Architecture. Um, that may have been a mistake. Who knows? It was about 18 months before I eventually kind of finished that one and got anywhere near to reading Genius Loci. But um, it was a formative experience. You know, mm. this was in my, my third year at, uh, at Bath. So I very much and I enjoyed that sense of, of, you know, delving into this world of ideas, which we weren't really doing in any of our lecture courses mm -hmm. and, and bringing that in and just seeing, you know, being a little bit of a a sort of provocateur, if you like, in yeah. terms of uh, uh, without really knowing what I was doing. <clears throat> but it just, yeah, it just felt really as though there was something really interesting there that we weren't really being being taught about. But Norberg Schultz, and you make this point in your introduction to Merleau-Ponty for Architects, Norberg Schultz, sorry, Merleau-Ponty doesn't really talk about architecture, but Norberg Schultz takes phenomenological ideas and applies them to architecture. So how did you get I suppose I'm kind of interested in, in, in the journey to the book. Like, where does the book come about? How does it come about? Is it, you know, sort of reverse engineering Mer um, Norberg Schultz into Heidegger, into Merleau-Ponty? Uh, to some extent, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. Norberg Schultz really draws on Heidegger mm -hmm. and doesn't, doesn't really touch. I don't think he mentions Merleau-Ponty. It may be much later. Uh, but no, that, that, that was the dominant... <clears throat> sort of thread, if you like, within architecture, um, that it was phenomenology meant Heidegger and then as interpreted by Norberg Schultz. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it sort of runs up against a bit of a barrier. And for many architects, it's a kind of mental block there because it seems as though if you take that Heideggerian strand, you can end up quite quickly stuck in a little bit of a dead end because it seems to be all about looking backwards, lo trying to unearth some kind of original moment um, as though that's always where you need to begin. And I think that's, that is a problem with Norberg Schultz's reading of Heidegger. So I don't blame Heidegger completely for that, but I, partly maybe. But I think what Norberg Schultz does in the concept of genius loci is kind of just sort of freeze that in a sense, as though there is some inner essence to the character of a place. And that's been there from whenever, time immemorial, and we have to just kind of find it. You know, it's, mm. just, it's a fixed and static thing. And if we're sensitive enough, we can, we can, we can capture it. And then we just manifest that in our, in our design, you know, in our mm. building. We just kind of project an image of, of that. That, I think, is, a, is problematic. And I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I could see the shortcomings of that straight away, but I, well, fairly quickly, but I, I wasn't um, really then sure quite how to, how to deal with that. You know, how, how can we get around that? Mm. So it really happened in the next phase of my education, I suppose. I mean, having worked in practice for a few years, realized I wanted to get into teaching full time. Also then, of course, quickly realizing I needed a, a kind of specialism, you know, mm. offer, obviously to get a job full time in teaching, needed to be able to offer lectures and so on. And um, and I thought, well, maybe I maybe I should teach construction or something based on my experience at Cullinan's office. You know, that seemed to make some kind of sense. But I certainly felt like I needed a, a master's degree uh, at that point, if not a PhD. And at that point, early uh, mid 1990s, you could get a teaching post full time without a PhD. Uh, that's true, but probably not without a master's or with at least some clear expertise in, mm -hmm. in one area. So I managed to then think about, well, okay, maybe I need a, a stepping stone into teaching. I should go back to university, basically study for a year or two, um, and, then, and then apply for full-time teaching. So I managed to get funding to go to the University of Pennsylvania. So that's really where I encounter um, uh, uh, ideas from, from Melo Ponti and a whole load of, of other um, other sources, but that that was a that was a key experience. Mm. Um, anybody who knows uh, the school at, at Penn, uh, it's still in a way quite sort of um, orient, let's say, oriented towards phenomenology or, or more sort of built from a phenomenological uh, kind of position uh, through people like David Leatherbarrow, who is, is still teaching there now. He was te was already teaching. I think he was chair of the architecture department then. But the PhD program, which I joined, I was only doing a master's, but you're, you're sort of absorbed into this larger group of, of PhD students, was then run by Joseph Rickwort, mm -hmm. who's uh, you know well-known uh, uh, architectural historian, and uh, Marco Frascari, who passed away a few years ago, 
but were that that mix those three characters uh you know they they didn't all get on you know totally you know they each had a very distinct kind of view of the world but somehow you know they built something really quite special i think as a a body well both a body of students but mm. a, a kind of a discourse incredibly rich and fertile and so on so Meloponti was one of those names that, that that came up in just in discussions again as much from other students there one particular student uh terence galvin who's now head of architecture in in, in at school in canada um he had been taught he'd done a master's with alberto perez gomez at uh, mcgill university and perez gomez was was teaching uh, meloponti so it was really terry that kind of brought that if you like uh, to penn it came up in a seminar quite early on and I thought, okay, yeah, here's somebody I need to know about. I'd never heard the name before. Mm. And it's very much became, oh, okay, this is a whole different strand. It's still phenomenology, but here's, here's a very different approach and, and something I, I just thought, immediately thought, yeah, this, this, is what, this is what I'm looking for. So thank you for that. The, the two things, one, what's phenomenology? And two, how does Merleau-Ponty make it specific? I mean, these are like exam questions and I apologize for that, but I, but I think it's, so from, so I started studying in 1998 at University of Manchester and there was a strand there which talked about phenomenology, certainly. And then when I went and did my, my, my um, diploma slash masters at Sheffield, there was still this thing and phenomenology, Gaston Bachelard and uh, Palasma and Norberg Schultz was still kicking around. And the architects that they manifest, well, were seen as manifesting their stuff. People like Peter Zumpther and Zverfen and um, uh, I guess to a certain extent, people like Glenn Murcutt as well. Um, and, and obviously British examples too, but, but, but it was, as I said in my notes to you, it always has, it's always remained slightly beyond my grasp. So I would be gr extremely grateful for um, you to kind of, I suppose, simply describe what this phenomenology, Edmund Husserl's idea of phenomenology and how we get to where we are with it. And then how Merleau-Ponty inflects it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's the key key question. You're right. I mean, I always start in 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 my lectures. I always start with just with the word itself, just as a, a bit of etymology of uh, the word phenomenology. Because if you just take it apart, simply, it just means literally the study of phenomena. Mm -hmm. And that could be anything, you know, the study of things, if you mm -hmm. like. Um, the reason it's, uh, it becomes useful is that what, what, then when we explain what we mean by phenomena, uh, it's not just things, if you like, in themselves. The key thing is that it's things as they show up in our experience. So it's really the, the, the key principle is, yeah, it's a philosophy of experience, let's say. That that's what it involves. The uh, analysis, or well, begins as description, let's say. The, the key principle, one of the key principles is that it's often called phenomenological description. It's just a way of describing our experience, describing the way in which the world appears to us. So and, it's distinct from epistemology and ontology. So it's another ology. So it's not about the study of knowledge or the study of being but it's the study of experience or does it sit sort of as a footnote to those well i guess it's closer to epistemology in a sense because it is the study of the way in which we come to have knowledge about the world okay so it is closer to that of course in heidegger's work it's it's very much ontology as well you know it's the study of being or the study of things things as they are mm -hmm. but heidegger qualifies that of course in his famous term dasein which means being there so it's not being in the totally abstract sense it's about being in a place being somewhere specific mm -hmm. and that that's where you have to begin with philosophizing you, mm -hmm. you first have to begin with yourself if you like as a philosopher in a place you know with a body and in a real physical place so Heidegger's version of phenomenology is very much uh, related to um, the, the American pragmatism, what's called uh, the pragmatist philosophy, which the uh, you know, key principle of which is exactly that, that before we can begin to have philosophical thoughts, we have to first just open our eyes and get a grasp on where we are in the world, you know, mm -hmm. that we are alive, we have a body and we're in a place and we can stumble around in it for a minute and eventually get our bearings uh, and now we can start to think about well, what just happened you know almost literally um, and then can we abstract from that some principles you know and then can we begin to do philosophy 
Mm-hmm. So that's how that's my reading of, of Heidegger, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, yes, Heidegger and Meloponti both in his, uh, draw so much of their inspiration, at least from uh, Edmund Husserl. Mm-hmm. And Husserl, very much the father of, of phenomenology, uh, let's say. Uh, 1900 publication, Logical Investigations, is a very convenient uh, landmark of, for many reasons, you know, a convenient starting point. But then you have to, I, I always, again, as a way of introducing what phenomenology is trying to do, uh, I don't tend to spend much time with Husserl because I find his work still incredibly complex, difficult, and somewhat contradictory in a sense. So much less useful, I would say, to us as architects, mm-hmm. much less useful than Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. Um, Heidegger was taught directly by Husserl. Uh, Merleau-Ponty wasn't. But Meloponti did go and study at the Husserl archives in, in Belgium, at Leuven in, in Belgium, and, um, and in a way imbibed the, the same influence really from, from Husserl, looking at unpublished manuscripts that Husserl had left. Um, so he wasn't taught by him directly, but you can see him in the same lineage. Mm. But to go back to the question, really, what is it that phenomenology, why is it, why does it uh, sort of, get, why, why does it have this label? Why does it become a school of philosophy? Mm-hmm. Why is it seen as a new thing or, you know, kind of an innovation in philosophy? It's basically, I always say, well, it's because it takes up an, an age old philosophical problem. And, and part of that problem is the split between the mind and the body. That's one part of it. So, of course, that we have to go back to the 17th century to say, well, where does that really come from? Uh, mainly from the work of Descartes, French rationalist, so-called philosopher, who very uh, clearly and distinctly separates the, the physical body, if you like, uh, what he calls, you know, extended stuff uh, from mental stuff, from uh, from the mind. Um, so he, he invents, if you like, that philosophical problem which then subsequent generations of philosophers have tried to resolve. Now, what uh, what phenomenology tries to do in a sense is have another go at trying to put those things back together. And you can trace it back. And the other part of that problem, of course, you can go back further to the 18th century to Immanuel Kant. And, and Kant is probably even more so than, uh, than, than Descartes. Kant also you know, has another go at trying to solve that that same problem of trying to understand how we can have knowledge of the world. You know, how can we understand anything about the world? Um, I mean, he's trying to resolve uh, a split which comes about um, partly through um, uh, through science, really, through Newtonian science. You know, and the Newtonian model of the universe is that uh, everything is the same everywhere. There are sort of these key principles that govern the way um, uh, physical entities behave in uh, in space and time. Um, and these rules apply, the Newtonian rules apply everywhere uh, equally. Mm-hmm. Um, and it paints a world, Newton builds a world, which is like, a bit like a, like a pool table, you know, by bill- or billiard balls, you know, being, being bashed around on a pool table. Um, and human, human beings are just subject to uh, external forces acting on them and apparently have no uh, real free will, if you like, or no, there's no kind of moral aspect to human decision making Mm -hmm. it seems as though we're just subject to forces acting on us now of course that's what Kant is very is reacting against he's certainly terrified as others were kind of terrified by that idea that human beings could just abdicate any responsibility for their actions so he's he just saw that as you know kind of denial of any sort of human morality Mm -hmm. uh, human ethics Um, so he tries to resolve that and and the Kant's solution to that problem was, uh, was basically to say, well, all those Newtonian laws, they're not out there in the world. They're, they're up here in our heads. And we, we, we just project those kind of formulas or those, those principles onto the world in order to give it some sense of order. But mm-hmm. they're not actually out there. Mm-hmm. Or at least they might, they're probably not, or they might not be. Uh, but let's say this is just humans' way of experiencing the world or the way of our understanding our experience mm-hmm. of the world is that we project these Newtonian principles onto the world. And likewise, we, pr- we project uh, moral principles as well. Mm-hmm. So that was Kant's way of preserving um, human life as we know it, if you like, mm-hmm. you know, the way of preserving human free will and mm-hmm. therefore human morality and human responsibility mm-hmm. for actions and behavior and, and so on. Mm-hmm. So he puts everything inside the head and says, yeah, we project everything out onto the world. 
So that, that's one way of resolving, if you like, the mind, the sort of resolving that mind-body problem. But of course, it's, it's a bit unsatisfactory and it just festers away, if you like, that, that problem. Mm. And Husserl, at the beginning of the 20th century, says, uh, more or less, says, well, you know, let's have another go at trying to resolve that. You know, that, uh, that sort of rev- what was quite revolutionary, obviously, in the 18th century, that uh, Kant should put, put this forward as a, as a potential resolution, quite revolutionary, but slightly mad at the same time. <laughs> So Husserl and then Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, they're, they're all basically trying to say, well, let, let's have another go at seeing, trying to understand this relationship between ourselves and the world. How can we, how can we have knowledge of, of what seems like an outside world and ourselves that seem to be kind of locked away inside our heads? I see. So, so we have this idea, so this Cartesian idea, this Descartes idea, this Cartesian idea, which from what, how you're explaining it and how Kant reacts to it, has this has the, how would I put it, uh, ha, seems to imply that the world, the universe, is amoral. And it enables, and I think this is Hannah Arendt's point, it enables a sort of new mode of engaging with both each other, but also the earth. Um, and I guess Kant, looking at the world of the 17th, 18th century, sorry, um, 17th or 18th, 18th century. 18th century. Um, starting to see the peculiarity of industrialization, the peculiarity of mass urbanization and industrial poverty, probably is reacting in a way to, to what seems to be the, amor- the, the implications or the, 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 the actions that derive from an amoral, a view of the universe as an amoral and indifferent space means that people can, and this is Aaron's point about the discovery of the new world by, by uh, discovery, sorry, the, 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 um, the um, exploration of the new world by, by Western Europeans um, or, or Europeans, is that they, they encounter it and their reaction to it is one of um, unadulterated exploitation. And so maybe what Husserl is doing and then Heidegger later is trying to invest the world or what, with a kind of, as you say, a, a morality um, because the consequences of an amoral engagement with the world, the Holocaust, the Second World War, the First World War, Victorian urbanization, so on and so forth, are simply too much to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's true. Yeah, I, but I think one of the complaints about phenomenology is that it's um, it seems to get too sidetracked with um, with the individual philosophizing from the point of view of the individual okay. and not dealing with those obviously much larger mm-hmm. social and um, you know sociological, cultural, uh, and political um, concerns, mm-hmm. which are of course you know contextual. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's an interesting trajectory, certainly within Melo Ponty's work, mm-hmm. where you see an attempt to come to terms with with exactly that that problem. Yeah, and to, you talk about in the book he, he, the, the, this this two these two aspects of uh, sort of ethics and aesthetics, which we can get onto. But I was wondering if you, you it starts your book um, discusses this this. Um, line that he tries to walk, that Merleau-Ponty tries to walk between realism and intellectualism, realism being the world is, um, well, maybe you'd be, you'd be the better man to describe that than me. Well, it, it maps onto a division within, uh, yeah, you, you've, you've, you've kind of named it already, the division within the history of philosophy, um, certainly from, from Descartes onwards, mm-hmm. uh, what's often called uh, empiricism as mm-hmm. well, if you like, uh, realism stroke empiricism. Which broadly, broadly means, uh, you know, we see ourselves as passive agents, as human beings. We, we're basically passive agents, subject to um, information which is uh, bombarding us from from the world, if you like. So we're just passive recipients, absorbing that information and then trying to make some sense of it. That's mm-hmm. broadly, yeah, that realist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's physical. It goes back to Newton again, you know, the, the, the idea of the physical universe and the billiard balls and so on. Uh, yes, human beings are just sort of buffeted about by these ex- external forces. The intellectualist, often called rationalist approach, of course, is uh, what really 
guess begins with with uh, Descartes, um, but uh, it, it, it reaches an extreme. Obviously, with that Kantian position, is that we we're the opposite of the of the first one. Instead of being utterly passive uh, and and just subject to to information coming in, uh, we're we're active, but we're so active that we're producing everything. In a sense, <laughs> we're projecting everything out onto the world. Um, so the world just takes on, if you like, a kind of human uh, pseudo, you know, every, it, we, we see ourselves everywhere because we projected ourselves mm -hmm. into the into the world. So that intellectualist approach, if you like, mm -hmm. is too is too active. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and that's the again, the sort of the split or, as you say, the line between those two is is what uh, Melo Ponti is trying to to explore and, and, and trying to see how you can resolve. How can we possibly resolve? Uh, you know, resolve those two things. So, I mean, he does it uh, initially in his early work and his most famous work, I guess, The Phenomenology of Perception, which he publishes in, in 1945, which is a little bit like a PhD, it's beyond the PhD, but it's somewhat equivalent in his career to um, Heidegger's major work, Being in Time, and it occupies a similar role. Um, so he's relatively young, and it puts him on the intellectual map. Uh, certainly in in France, gets him you know the big job as a, as a professor. Um, but what he does in that is to start from the individual, start from the body. So uh, phenomenology of perception is very much about understanding how we are as perce perceiving human beings. How do how do we, in a sense, kind of reach out in, into the world? Mm -hmm. So that's where the body. But he begins with the body. That that's his um, or bodily experience, and really mm -hmm. trying to understand, to take apart the nature of that embodied encounter with the world first. And, if you like. and so we understand the world through the way that we physically interact it, which we then intellectualize, so to speak, that we, which we then transpose into our minds. So rather than the other way around of being minds that, okay, right. So, so the bodies then become critical in Merleau-Ponty's idea of... Yeah, very much so, yeah. So it's, uh, it's often described as uh, uh, a philosophy of the, of the body subject mm -hmm. or the embodied subject. You know, to be a human subject is, in, firstly, primarily, is to be embodied. Um, mm -hmm. Now that, of course, counts for all, all forms of life, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, to be alive whether you're a plant, an animal, a plant or a bacterium, you know, to, to be alive is to have a body, you know, and you, 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 you there's no way to be alive other than uh, through having a body, however minuscule that, that is. Um, and you're in a body in a place. So you're embodied mm -hmm. and emplaced um, by, by definition. Mm -hmm. that, that's that, that's that, that's the principle of any uh, any form of life. So that's the beginning, then, of course, of your um, encounter with 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 the world. Mm -hmm. And to be alive is to be able to respond to the world. So, you know, you can see human intelligence, if you like, as a very advanced stage of the simpler, if you can go back to you know, simpler and simpler forms of life um, that uh, are not conscious in the way that we are, self-conscious or self-aware. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, even even a bacterium, you know, has has some ability to respond to what's mm -hmm. going on in, in its environment. Uh, so perception again is is a sort of absolute kind of grounding building block of of um, living uh, living entities. Mm -hmm. They have what we call perception, if you like, but some might call it just an ability to react or an ability to respond. They're in some kind of exchange exchange of information. We often call it some sort of communication with their environments. Now, of course, the more sophisticated forms of life uh, eventually, of course, as we know, have things called brains, which are able to handle complex information, but we shouldn't get too carried away uh, with the idea that the brain is the person, in a sense, that everything is going on inside the brain or the brain is making decisions about the, you know, what Meloponti is talking about is a brain which is an, an emergent property, if you like, or uh, an, an element of, uh, of what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And human intelligence is an emergent property of interacting with, with the world, you know, being a human being in the world. Um, and our brains, of course, develop and carry on developing uh, right through our lives constantly in response to each experience that we have. But we, we should start there and trying to understand experience as, as learning, basically as learning experience uh, from from the beginning. So so the materials of the world, the things and that we encounter, the things that we, we perceive doubt, as embodied, emplaced beings are also in a feedback loop with us. They give to us 
um, information about the world that we perceive. So it's not, you know, a pure projection of the mind. We are not just, as you say, just a brain. But through this reciprocity between the stuff of the world and the stuff of ourselves, there's a, as you say, um, the brain emerges and, and understands things. Yeah, or the mind, I guess we should probably say accurately, yes, the mind. Yeah, the, the brain, mind. we could say as a biological organ. <laughs> uh, but You've stopped. But the mind is more than what's going on inside, into the environment. I mean, there's a really interesting kind of fuzzy uh, definition. If you think of the mind as being, of course, beyond the brain, that, mm -hmm. that's the key thing. The mind is both the brain and the body and bits of the world. Mm. which we pick up from time to time and um, for, you know, as we do with our immediate environment, you know, when we organize a workspace to make our working practice more efficient, uh, those, those tools help us think as well. You know, as architects, we're used to doing this. We don't often think about it, but picking up a, a pen to make some notes or to sketch in a sketchbook is seamlessly, you know, a great illustration of that seamless connection, if you like, between um, ourselves and the world. And, mm -hmm. and to be able to say precisely where the thinking is happening, is a really interesting question, you know, because it's not just inside the brain and it's not just in the sketchbook, but it's somewhere in that nexus of thing. You know, it, it doesn't where you take any one of those components away and the process breaks down. It doesn't mm. work. So the sketchbook and the pen and the brain, well, the hand that holds the pen and the brain um, are equally important in a, in, into that uh, thinking process. So the body, I think the key thing with Merleau-Ponty is to get away from, uh, from what we inherit from Descartes, which is this idea of the body as an object or the body simply as another, you know, one amongst all the other objects in the world. So I think one of Merleau-Ponty's key statements, I suppose, is to say that, yeah, the, the body is not uh, an object in the world. The body is some kind of orientation towards the world. So the body is actually, yeah, not an object, but it's a set of capacities or a set of abilities to do things in the world mm -hmm. that often involve picking up bits of the world and momentarily making them part of our bodies. Literally tools, hand tools, pens, hammers, Heidegger uses the same example, uh, hammers and saws, uh, motor cars, you know, whatever, um, all, all those kind of technical extensions. And I would say as an architect, including the, the, the architectural setting in which particular actions take place and maybe of course even the city in which the space is located mm -hmm. you know all of those are kind of organizations of space that enable things to happen that mm -hmm. couldn't really happen without them and to, to draw a kind of distinction to say no no the body ends at the skin and then the world begins end of story that's problematic so mm -hmm. that's what Meloponti and Heidegger I think they're both equally equally important on on this um, uh, uh, are really pushing us to, to get away from. So for Meloponti, I think what's really interesting is how much detail he goes into there around this idea of, of the body as a, as a, as a, as a what, what he calls an orientation towards the world, a set of abilities, set of possibilities that we have to engage with, uh, to engage with, the, uh, with the world around us. So all of that really is part of his, his first major book, The Phenomenology of Perception, is very much kind of building a picture, complex, but I think still very accessible picture of, of the so-called body subject or the, the embodied subject. Yeah. I think this is really fascinating. It seems to me to imply a sort of moral um, obligation in the architect to do things, therefore, if the, if, if the if architecture in its component parts, in its details, in its total form, in its urban setting, is in some way, as people encounter it, um, a collaborator in that human being's mm -hmm. beingness, identity, then there's a moral or an ethical obligation embedded in the process of making architecture such that it doesn't um, disfigure them and reduce them and uh, enables them to, 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 um, to do what they need to do, to, to self-actualize, to, to be what they need to be. Is that right? Yeah, Is that absolutely. the implication of it? I would say so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, that's one of the key, key issues again for me. And I think, uh, you know, a really important uh, aspect of Merleau-Ponty's philosophy, which is often 
overlooked. And I think you, you, we would extend, you know, beyond the city, let's say beyond the boundaries of the city. Let's, you know, we can talk about uh, ethical relationship uh, with, or what should be, you know, <laughs> ethical relationship with the environment uh, as such, you know, the global environment and, and sustain, and, you know, we can start to build, a, if you like, an ecological philosophy, you know, a philosophy mm. of sustainability uh, around, uh, you know, the interdependent, you know, we are utterly dependent on our environments uh, for a sense of who, um, of, of, uh, of who we are. Yeah. So that's that's important. And people are writing about this uh, now. I mean, it's become, thankfully, you know, this has been now becoming a mainstream uh, discourse, which, uh, which 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 is great. But it's it's interesting in that it's it is kind of questioning our, uh, a lot of our assumptions about uh, where identity, you know, on on what is our identity based, you know, because mm-hmm. we, we talk so much still about the kind of the notion of a kind of inner self, you know, we have an essential self again, which we can just if we can just look deeply enough inside ourselves. We'll, we'll find it. Um, but yeah. uh, Meloponti, Heidegger, and the pragmatist philosophers likewise are all in a sense saying, yeah, we, we, it's not about looking inside to find ourselves, it's about looking out. And it's only in our encounter with the world, which is both you know, a social and cultural world as well as a, a physical one, a built and a, and a natural world. Um, that's, that's where we really find ourselves and we do it by, by making. It's, a, it's an act of making in a sense of, of self construction but we can't do it on our own you know we we, we have to we have to take on board uh networks of th- actors now we mm-hmm. would say in 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 contemporary parlance actor network theory i was um, going to say this this seems to prefigure bruno latour's actor network theory yeah i would like to think so absolutely yeah and um and, and right, I think well, latour is obviously talking about technology and but technology is a is a complicated thing. It doesn't just mean that, it doesn't mean the internet, but it can mean, as you say, a hammer or a pin. Mm-hmm. At which point, it, the the difference between A and T and what you're talking about, this phenomenology, this Merleau-Pontian mm-hmm. phenomenology, is the difference is very difficult to 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 to, to split, isn't it? Yeah, I think you can see that, uh, that there's definitely a lineage there through mm-hmm. um, 20th century French philosophy, let's say, just mm-hmm. to be a bit more specific about it. But from Meloponti on to uh, Michel Foucault and uh, other thinkers like Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze draws, I think, a little bit more directly on um, uh, phenomenology, particularly, but um, on Meloponti and, and others. And then on to Bruno Latour. Well, even sociology, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, I was thinking mm-hmm. of uh, likewise. Um, and the connection the with of the habitus, which you mentioned. Yeah, well, I think that's in another dimension, really. And, and mm-hmm. it comes in in this what, what you could call the second part of Meloponti's career, if you like. I mean, his, if we're painting his career in a kind of trajectory, I would say, OK, we, if we close the, the door on that first chapter, if you like, the, the, the major book, Phenomenology of Perception, where we, we're still, in a way, talking about from an, in, uh, from an individual point of view, how do we reach out? towards the world, Meloponti himself accepts that there's a limitation in, in that position, if you like, a starting position, which he, I think, yeah, inherits more or less from, uh, from Husserl, the idea that um, there is uh, some kind of opposition between the self and the world, and he still feels a little bit as though he's trapped in that sort of Cartesian universe, you know, of being a thinking mind reaching out into a, you know, into a, a physical world. So in Meloponti's kind of second phase, he becomes much, much more preoccupied with these larger kind of social structures which pre-exist the individual, trying to understand how this world, you know, if, sort of into which the individual seems to be trying to reach, um, how, how that world is structured and what impact that has on our experience. Mm. And Meloponti's sort of prime example of that is, is language, is to talk about human language, you know, human communication, and to look at the structures that govern the way that language works and particularly to focus on the extent to which those structures are collective. You know, they're invented by other people. You know, we, we generally don't get to create a new language for ourselves individually. Of course, by definition, nobody else would understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what Meloponti does in his sort of middle period, if you like, in his career, 
through tends to be through shorter works. He did start a book which never quite got finished, um, but it's it so it comes out in more fragmentary form in a series of essays that are then published together as as collections. But really focusing on language, and probably the key collection is a book called Signs, or was translated into English as, as Signs. And um, he was really taking the almost the old, the opposite perspective in a sense of beginning with language, beginning with these kind of social cultural structures and looking at the way in which they structure, in a sense, the, the individual, you know, how, how do we become, instead of the, the embodied subject, which is the focus of the first phase of his career, we get what could be called the linguistic subject in, in this second phase. So we get sort of, we coming at it, looking down the other end of the telescope now, and we're now seeing the way in which as individuals, we are inevitably subject to some extent to structures which pre-exist any of us individually. You know, they're structures we inherit, they're in our society, uh, the world that we grow up in, the language that we're taught, you know, from our mother tongues and, and, and so on. So that I think is a really important aspect of, um, of Melo Ponti's work, which obviously takes him in a sense from phenomenology almost into structuralism mm. um, and the philosophy of structure. I'm sure you've had uh, a, a, another podcast that, that deals with this, but uh, it's curious in a say, if you weren't expecting to find this, you know, in, in Melo Ponty, but he was a very close friend of uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, the, the French uh, anthropologist. Mm. And, and what, again, one of the key figures in the emergence of, of, of structuralism. Uh, and that seems unlikely initially. You just think what on earth, you know, could Melo Ponty and Lévi-Strauss have, have had in common? Uh, but you get a sense, I think, as you look at Melo Ponti's career overall, mm -hmm. that he makes the is really ch 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 challenging connections. He's really trying to, to 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 deal with, you know, try and build a comprehensive picture of how experience must be some kind of coming together of an individual. Of course, we each experience the world uniquely. We each have a unique point of view on the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we find ourselves, or we discover ourselves, if you like, through our uh, ability to interact with a world which is already structured for us. And language just happens to be the sort of arch example, if you like, that yeah. Nello Ponti spends most of his time talking about. But I think it's fairly straightforward to extrapolate from that and say, yeah, of course, Merleau Ponty's phenomenology is much more aware of social and cultural structures mm -hmm. and, and politics too. And you know, he also wrote a lot about politics of, you know, the politics of his own time, you know, on a fairly day to day level. You know, he was editing along with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the uh, famous, of course, father of existentialism, if you like, also is another branch of phenomenology. And they were they were classmates as students and they went on to to uh, to launch a, a political uh, uh, journal in, uh, in 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 Paris, uh, of course, fell out uh, massively as uh, French intellectuals often do. Didn't speak to each other for you know, whatever the next ten years. Um, <laughs> but you know, you can you can see yeah, you can see strands of of, uh, of, of the interests. Uh, you know, you can understand Sartre's work if you like in that context, somewhere yeah. between Meloponti, Heidegger, and so on. But the point about Meloponti's interest in politics again is I think is important because it's often overlooked because people tend to think phenomenology is only about the individual. It's only talking about experience and it seems to be generalizing, if you like, from the experience of one, you know, a sample of one um, and, and universalizing that, you know, and mm -hmm. assuming that everybody has the same body and everybody has the sound. I accept that Meloponti, like other philosophers in the 20th century, were not you know, we're not particularly sensitive to issues of difference, if you like, individual difference and mm -hmm. cultural difference and so on. Issues yeah. around... and gender, disability, and so on. Not excluded by any means in Meloponti's uh, philosophy. Um, and the, it's left open, if you like, for, you know, for now, for us to kind of read back into what Meloponti is saying about, um, about the body and the importance of our embodiment in relation to what we're able to do in the mm. world, what capacities you know, we have, how are we able to engage. Um, it's, it's open, if you like, now for us to, to, to kind of fill in, fill in the gaps, in a sense, and really think about, okay, what are the implications of um, uh, different forms of embodiment? Because obviously, yeah, we're not, we're not all uh, made, made the same. Well, we made the same. This is um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting idea, and I'm 
glad you you picked up. I haven't spoken to anybody about structuralism, and I have to because um, because I think it is obviously, as you say, very very important. And 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 in this middle phase of his career, uh, Ponty's uh, intellectual career, you point this out. I was wondering though, the, so one of the things I think that we most clearly often pick up on a kind of very superficial level in architectural education is the association between phenomenology and materials or materiality, that word that gets bandied around now um, and, and is sort of assumed. It's always assumed, um, very, very little understood, but it kind of, and it, and it also becomes a kind of shorthand for a rather facile way of thinking about architecture, which I think we see realized in a lot of architecture now as well. It's actually, become a bit of a detriment you know if you stick some materials on it and make a sort of top left hand corner light come into the hallway you've kind of done phenomenology um or if you've made the, the rain screen on the outside of your building create a little bit of fuzziness around the corners then you've done phenomenology because you've kind of disfigured this and um but but the, this idea of a, mor a morality uh it, it seems to clash with this idea so like where do we get like where do this, this idea of material. So I'm trying to drag it back, I suppose, to, to how we encounter phenomenology and the works of Merleau-Ponty and, and other phenomenologists in, in everyday practice. Like how do we encounter beyond that very superficial reading of the philosophy of phenomenology? How do we encounter Merleau-Pontian ideas, I suppose? Um, who do we see it in? Who do it like, which kind of architects are using this, um, these ideas, um, even now or did, um, and how did they use it? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it's a key question. I, I devote more or less a, a chapter uh, mm -hmm. in, in the book, in the Merleau Ponty uh, for Architects, uh, a chapter to talk about this, because as you say, it, it's, it is one area in which mm -hmm. uh, Merleau Ponty's ideas can be, uh, I'd say can be seen, even if they're not heard, you know, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily being talked about explicitly uh you can you can feel them there there's yeah. something in the background uh but you, it may be that you know what we what we can do with that is just to say you know here's an illustration of something that Melo Ponti is talking mm -hmm. about it's not to say that those examples were particularly driven by specifically mm -hmm. motivated by somebody reading Melo Ponti mm -hmm. uh I think those those examples are uh, probably few and far between just because mm -hmm. yeah Melo Ponti's ideas have not not been as not been taken up you know as directly uh, in architecture as uh, even as Heidegger. Uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, Heidegger Maybe it's just because Heidegger is easier to read, because he is quite easy to read, Heidegger. Uh, you know, the, particularly building dwelling thinking is, a, I mean, I'm not yeah, you're wanting right. to sound too pretentious, but it's kind, it's, kind, it's kind of an easy read. Well, it is on one level, yeah. I mean, there's some abstraction in the language, obviously, but mm -hmm. then he does a lot of etymology. You know, he is mm -hmm. delving into the language yeah. um, in, in a slightly different way from um, what Melo Ponty does with language. But yeah, it does make the whole piece accessible. And obviously, it's a short piece, and it's mm -hmm. very much like this is Heidegger's essay on architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, and and so it's it's become, yeah, it's kind of digestible, you know, in that sense. And so no surprise, really, that it's um, that it's been so popular and so influential. And that's great. And there isn't uh, an equivalent to that essay in uh, in Melo Ponty's work. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't say, "Oh, here's Melo Ponty's essay on architecture." Uh, that's that's the way in. You know, it's yeah. it's yeah, much more difficult. I mean, phenomenology of perception is you you yeah is such a kind of in a way an obvious starting point, and yet it's really uh, difficult and it's it's enormous. You know, it's mm -hmm. like being in time. So. I think that's a problem. But the general point about materiality, what, what do we mean by that? Or what can we draw from, from Melo Ponty? Just to, just to kind of um, address that bit of the question first. Um, I think it goes right back to that uh, in his early work, this idea of the way in which we, we, we are, if you, if you like, as embodied subjects reaching out to, to engage with the world. Mm. Um, what does that mean? So... Um, I mean, it's 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 in a way more fundamental, actually, than just this idea of crossing a, a bridge. You know, as a, we, we use the body, we, we reach out into the world and we kind of lock into something. Um, Melo Ponty is saying something actually, I think, more more fundamental than that, which is that we um, the world it's. Self really only exists because these occupy space and they're made of material, you know, of, of, of human bodies. A physical body is a, is a physical entity. You know, we are made of. of 
materials. So that a world which is also spatial and material. Jonathan, so, um, you, you seized up uh, three key moments in this conversation. One, when you're talking about other bodies. Two, when you were just about to do that thing that you just said, and then again. So I don't yeah. know if you want to go back to that. And I yeah. can cut that out. I mean, like literally... You started speaking the sentence and then it disappeared. So, yeah. No, apologies. I, I saw my. I think my Wi-Fi signal did uh, dip a little bit there. Oh, I um, see. Yeah, I think the important thing really to remember is that uh, Mel Ponte is saying something I think a bit more, even more fundamental yeah. than just this idea that it's through the body that we can then reach out into the world, as though yeah. there is just a kind of bridge that we're trying to cross. There, the world is its own thing. and the body is its own thing and we can uh, he's suggesting is basically that the, the, the we can only know the world uh, as, a, as a spatial thing and as, as a material thing because we have a body which likewise is both a spatial thing and a material thing mm -hmm. so that our, our, our understanding of, of space and materiality is based on a sense a kind of inner sense that we have that we know what it is to occupy space and to be made of a material, you know, our physical bodies are, of course, material entities mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in themselves. So, I mean, there are different ways of describing that. Uh, I mean, I think in one place he even dis he even says um, the body is not in space, but the body haunts space, yeah. which is kind of hinting at a, almost a psychoanalytical kind of a under understanding of, of that, that relationship. I think it's a, a nice translation in a mm -hmm. sense, but what I think he's trying to say is a little bit more in a sense, pr pragmatic is just that idea that it's only by moving around in space that we begin to build a sense of, of three dimensionality. You know that mm -hmm. there is a three dimensional world. That there are objects in the world, and there's spaces between objects. And that goes back to one of Merleau-Ponty's sources, really, which is um, beyond Husserl and, and the philosophical sources. He's very influenced by um, Gestalt psychology. And the idea that in Gestalt psychology that we perceive a world of um, distinct entities and it's the we, th we are distinct wholes and that we only perceive anything because it seems to belong to an object. And it does that partly because it's it's in front of something else. So that there's a there's a horizon behind it, if you like, which is obscured by an object. And if we walk around behind the object, we'll be able to feel that space between the object and, and the background. So that's a key dimension of bodily spatiality, which is, if you like, that from which we get a sense of worldly spatiality. So that moving around and this idea that perception is a dynamic thing, that we can't just get it by standing still and looking, which is the more the sort of Cartesian analysis of vision is very much as a sort of passive screen and images are projected in through and hit the back of the retina and they're two dimensional flattened things. And then we just kind of try and decode them. Uh, he's saying that that's not how that's not how perception works. Uh, in, uh, it's a three-dimensional, it's ultimately it's all the senses working together and building a composite sense of a three-dimensional space. And that comes from movement. We have to move in order to perceive properly. And so for, in phenomenological architecture, there's an emphasis on buildings um, emerging that the architecture of the phenomenological architecture, as distinct, say, from a, a, a high modernist architect, which presents a kind of cipher, building as a kind of avatar of buildingness. We get this idea that architecture has to emerge as we go through it and the materials and the light and the sensory sensual content of the architecture is something that we then encounter in this way. So, so phenomenological thinking isn't, as you put it, as you put it in your book, um, it's not a, it's, not a design method or less a design method, more a powerful way of describing, discussing and deciding in inverted commas about architecture. So that's a rather lovely way of thinking about it, I think. Yeah, well, it really begins there. I mean, Mello Ponti, uh, yeah, makes makes that really, really clear at the beginning of the phenomenology of perception in, in the preface mm -hmm. to that, that ultimately he sees the, 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 the beginnings of phenomenology as a, as a sort of project of, of description. Mm. And then description and analysis, if you like. But he's really trying to say, let's let's just try and understand uh, what it is, what's going on, what do we encounter, you know, mm -hmm. as we as we move around in in the world. 
uh, let's let's just try and describe that first, you know, before we try and make you know those philosophical uh, abstractions mm. uh, uh, from it, you know, before we sort of step outside for a moment, kind of draw ourselves back from that and say, okay, what what can we say about what just happened? Mm. You say, let's just be in the moment, let's be in mm. the flow. Let's just try and understand that. And of course, again, I'd say that's another really good point of connection with, uh, yeah, as you said, how we how we think or how we should think as architects. You know, mm -hmm. how do us how do our buildings um, unfold as an experience in in time? Because time is just as important as space. You know, we can only encounter space properly through time. You know, mm -hmm. we have to move. Moving takes time, um, and uh, and and so on. So the counterpart to that, of course, is uh, where we started the question, which was around materiality. So the other aspect of that sort of bodily sense of, of the spatiality of the world is to do with the physicality of the objects that we encounter in the world. And again, we do that literally sometimes by just, you know, bumping up against things and, uh, and, and uh, assessing to what extent they, re they resist, if you like, our, our, our kind of encounter with them. You know, well, how does the world push back? And, yeah. um, uh, you know, that, that, that's, again, a sort of encounter, which is a kind of a slightly messy combination of the qualities of the thing, whatever the object is that we, that we bump into, and the qualities of our own uh, body or the capacities of our own bodies. So uh, this has been written about uh, what, uh, uh, a contemporary uh, Merleau-Ponty uh, scholar, uh, David Morris, described this as the, the crossing of the body and the world which I thought was a useful, and I think I quote it in the, in mm -hmm. the book, um, as a useful way of, you know, a reminder really about what we often forget, which is, you know, if we, if we think we've, we've uh, encountered an object and we've really understood it, you know, and we've drawn some information from it, whether it's, you know, I've just picked up a mug or a water bottle or something, and I put it down again, and I think, okay, I know something now about the weight of that thing and the temperature, the cold, the resistor, whatever. Um, but actually, what I've really experienced is not really the thing in itself only. What I've, what I've experienced is the way in which I interact with it. Mm -hmm. I've experienced the encounter. So a lot of that information is, is kind of confused in a way because it's, it's telling me something about the object, but it's telling me something about my body and my bodily capacity to interact with the object. Mm -hmm. Is it something I can pick up and put in my pocket? Or is it something I can't possibly move on my own? I need somebody to help me. Or is it something I should sit on? Is it a chair or a table? And can I, uh, yeah, is it strong enough to take my weight? Can I stand on it to, to pin drawings up on the wall? You know, all, all those Thing. So we're constantly doing that. But of course, we don't often stop to remember that or remind ourselves mm -hmm. that actually what we've just learned, if you like, what we've just experienced is precisely some strange interplay, some strange kind of overlap or interconnection between ourselves, our bodies and our capacities and some particular bit of the world. Wonderful. I wondered if you might just speak briefly to finish on where you think Merleau Ponty's theory, uh, philosophy um, of phenomenology might uh, take us in the future. I mean, I have another paper here by you in the Sage Handbook of Architectural Theory on the post-human. And I wondered if there was some kind of connection there with this idea that you've already alluded to, which is the, um, the idea of a kind of, uh, the way that Mario Ponti's philosophy might help us kind of disestablish this rather um, what we now see as unrealistic distinction between the mind and the body, between the humans as a very distinct, between the between humans as a very distinct entity in the world. And I wondered if there might be some way of, yeah, something that you'd like to open up about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I I, I certainly suggest that uh, towards the, the towards the end of the book that um, I think it's an important aspect of Meloponti's work and his his whole uh, outlook really is to say that um, uh, yeah, it's not because he's often criticised as belonging to you know a, a historical mm -hmm. sort of generation of apparently you know humanist let's say broadly labelled humanist thinkers that seem to still, you know, treat the human subject as a kind of sovereign entity, you mm. know, from which everything else begins or through which the world should be seen. Um, and I think uh, it's OK. You know, there are aspects of his work where that does seem to be his position and certainly in his earlier work. Uh, but I think that he 
absolutely transcends that in in his in his later work and and ultimately i think we are yeah left with a notion much more interesting but much fuzzier notion of of the human being uh, in, in inevitably kind of enmeshed in a in a in a network of of things like we mentioned with actor network theory you know enmeshed in in networks of you know technical material uh, human and non-human actors and so on so one way of translating that into current terminology would be to say um, yeah i could see melo ponty as a an inspiration if you like for for what's called today post post humanist understanding of the human subject uh, which is uh, yeah precisely to to kind of take take the boundaries away for the moment and to see ourselves as yeah utterly enmeshed utterly reliant on things going on around us and um and and hopefully in a more kind of equitable balance with our environments um both you know natural and uh, and and built so i think that's definitely one area or well a couple of a couple of areas there probably post humanist thinking in in the general sense uh, but also um ecological and uh, and uh, sustainable uh, thinking you know to of course needing to keep reminding ourselves about how dependent we are uh, on 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 the environment for our definitions of um, you know of who who we are and as as individuals and as a uh, as a species so i think there's uh, definitely openings there to to future uh, uh, you know development if you like of meloponti's thinking or good reasons to look back at his work uh, as a basis you know for moving forward um as well as some of those perhaps more more perennial uh, themes in architecture that, that we've touched on like uh, like, like uh, materiality tectonic expression in in architecture which are if you like more well well established now um and uh, and in a sense more straightforward i suppose as applications of both meloponti and heidegger uh, and phenomenology more more generally fabulous thank you so very much that was a wonderful point to finish on great well thank you it's been really uh, yeah really interesting uh, conversation well that was <clears throat> phenomenal Thanks to Jonathan for joining me to speak about the book. Please see the podcast description for links to it, to Jonathan's professional profile and social media presence, and a short essay on the Body of Theory website by Jonathan on Merleau Ponty, which is worth a read too. And please like, subscribe, follow, and share this episode. And thanks for listening. Cheers.